having us here today. Uh, thank you so much for having us here today. Senator Cantwell, thank you so much for being part of this and your leadership on, around the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. As you know, our industry has really been hit hard in the past few years. Um, we've lost thousands of restaurants, um, really had a lot of challenges. And I think a lot of people um, now seeing people in restaurants feeling like things are getting better. And so I think talking a little bit about the headwinds we're facing and some of the challenges we have today is important for all people around Washington to understand uh, where their local business is at and how they're doing and, and moving forward. Um, one of the big issues we have um, is during the height of COVID, restaurants built up a lot of debt. Your average full service restaurant uh, per location is about $160,000 in debt. On an average 4% margin, they're gonna spend three years with no income trying just to get out of this hole. And, and as we know, these aren't just normal times. That average margin is hard to hit. Um, when we have challenges like Omicron going on, they continue to take a bite out of our employees. Our workforce shortage continues to be a major issue. Here in Washington alone, we're short 40,000 workers, which means we can't operate full shifts or full operations. And then we have these ongoing impacts of COVID from uh, supplier shortages and products simply not showing up each week and, um, and uh, inflation. So our headwinds to just try to catch up to normal times to pay off this big debt are huge. Uh, we're, we're raising the red flag that we're worried this race against debt isn't going well. Um, and there's a solution to help. There's a vehicle that can help this. Uh, Senator Cantwell very uh, heroically helped sponsor that first round of restaurant revitalization fund, which helped a lot of restaurants apply their debt and get out of debt. Unfortunately, about 55% of Washington restaurants who qualified um, didn't get it because there simply wasn't enough funding. So we're hopefully to talk today about how important it would be to backfill the rest of that restaurant revitalization fund. Uh, here to talk to some real operators um, and get the word about how important it is for our main streets and our small businesses moving forward. So thanks for being here today. Uh, and Senator Cantwell, thanks for having us. Anything you wanna say here as we get started? Well, Anthony, thank you so much for helping us host this roundtable and to all the participants, thank you uh, for continuing to work during the COVID pandemic and to help us discuss this issue today and how your community is being impacted. We wanna take today's information and go back to Washington DC and fight even harder to get a second round, uh, an additional round for restaurant funding in the upcoming months. This is so important to do because what we've heard just from the National Restaurant Association, just in surveys that they released yesterday, that conditions by restaurant tours are worse today than they were just three months ago. So it shows us that the Omicron variant of the COVID pandemic is just one more wave of uh, pressure on our local restaurants, which are such great employers for our community. Anton, uh, Anthony just mentioned this issue about the fact that in the COVID package that included funds for restaurants, only about half or a little more than half of the businesses from our state who were eligible actually got help and support of that program. So by refunding uh, and capitalizing that program, we hope help and support can go out to so many more restaurants. The good news is there's a bipartisan effort by my colleague, Senator Cardin and Wicker and myself and, and Susan Collins and many others who are working to try to get this legislation included in any of the must pass bills that we need to do in the next couple of months. So I hope that today you can share with us stories to bring back to our colleagues about why this is so important, why restaurants are so important to our communities, why you already operate on thin margins, why it's a miracle you're even here now after what's happened with the COVID pandemic that you've been able to survive so long, and why we need to restore some fairness in the fact that some restaurants got the funding and yet others who qualified didn't get the funding. We need our local communities to have these great businesses. And we want to continue to support you, even though the pandemic continues, we want us to go back and put these resources on the table to help stabilize restaurants across the state of Washington. So thank you, and thank you, Anthony. And I look forward to hearing everyone's comments. Well, Senator, again, thanks for having us and thanks for your leadership on this. We really wanna hear from a lot of the operators. We've got operators of different sizes and areas of the state 
that all have a similar story. Uh, Steve Valenta from Mighty Bull down in Vancouver. Why don't, why don't we start with you? You, you helped organize, among other operators, support groups down in Vancouver talking about the crises and the, and the shared struggles. Um, but let's talk about you this time, not everyone else. How are you doing with this? What would the revitalization fund mean to you if we could backfill it? Uh, thank you. Uh, good to see everybody. Thank you, Senator, for your time. I will say, um, just to touch on, um, we're here because of PPP funds. We wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for those two rounds. So I just want you to, I just want to say thank you because our staff is still working. My family's being fed. Our community still gets what we have to offer because of those PPP funds. It worked. So, um, but where we're at now, and we are, we are keying in on this last, uh, basically fourth quarter of last year, um, things really did take a turn for the worse and, and we're running out of money. And, and that's what's happened. It's worked, but we need more because we're out. Um, it's, it's, it's a known thing. It's obvious about our industry runs on these, these slim and these narrow margins. And what fixes that is volume. Restaurants work well when we have high volume. And so volume is just taking a major hit through this, especially through Omicron. So um, what we're specifically seeing is that people are staying home because of wanting to be safe. And then also office workers are staying home, even though they maybe came back two or three days out of the week, um, back to work. That's half of the time that we normally see them. So how can we expect to do more than half of our business if, if our customer base is gone? I mean, that's, that's easy math. And then um, the Omicron surge, it, what's different now is that it's really impacting staff in a way that it, that it hasn't in the past. If we've had one or two people sick, we can cover shifts and, and stay open. But when you have 25% of your staff sick, I mean, you've probably all seen it where you're going to your favorite restaurant and you show up and they're not open. And there's a note on the door that said that we too many staff are sick. That's happening all over the place. And that hasn't happened throughout any of this um, of the pandemic. It's different. It's worse that way. And so, again, that's fewer days that we're open. And then, then again, volume goes down. And so that's, we're just being hit by that. Um, then we've got food costs. We've seen since October um, in, in fourth quarter, we saw a 24% uh, increase in our food costs. 24%. It's a huge number in, in, um, in, in an already slow and low margin kind of thing. So this fourth quarter, we've lost so much money. Um, it, it's just been shocking. We're stunned. Um, the, um, yeah, and then I think that there's this other piece that, that I'm experiencing is that restaurants, we, it's like, we're, we're a place that people come and they celebrate and there's a bit of a reprieve when they get to visit their favorite restaurant. And we have to put on like a really good face and that we're happy and like things, we're trying to like show people we're doing well through our social media stuff and then even just in person. But it's tough because like we're struggling with vulnerability because we can't really be that vulnerable because it, then it shows like weakness or it shows that we're close to failure. And so we're like caught in this hard spot about, about how to handle this. So um, I'm out of time, but that's about all I got. But thank you very much for, uh, for all of that. Steve, thank you. Thank you for your, for your story. And I'm sorry what you're going through and we'll have a chance to follow up some questions. Oliver from Normals in, in Seattle. Um, uh, is your story much different from, from Steve's? Uh, what would um, the backfill of re the restaurant revitalization fund mean for you? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Oh, great. Good to see you. So uh, it's not just Seattle, it's Pioneer Square, which you know, to begin with is always a challenge uh, as a business to survive. Uh, but 2020 January and 2022 January are such different stories for us. You know, we had, we were optimistic. We were, you know, we uh, acquired a commercial kitchen. We signed a couple of leases. We were gung-ho. We were going to go great. 2022 January, we're wondering how long we can survive. I can't open my restaurant for lunch because there's nobody in town. Most of the people are working from home. We don't have staff. And the prices, as Steve just mentioned, prices are just killing us. I mean... I was mentioning a case of Kingfisher has gone from $22 a case to $69 a case. I can't triple my price of beer. Nobody would buy it. And yet, you know, 
we have to keep our doors open. We have to, you know, pay our bills. Uh, Omicron, eight of my employees are out with Omicron. You know, we still have to, you know, I'm running food now. There's nothing we can do. We have to still survive. We cannot close the door because once you shut the door, it's so hard to open again. We do everything we can. We took care of our employees during the whole thing. PPP really helped us a lot. Uh, but, you know, we qualified. We didn't get any RRF money, not one penny. And that was the one that we were really, really banking on. It was going to be the real critical thing. We were optimistic that once we get that money, we can survive. Uh, I know an SBA tells us that, oh, if you don't get it, just apply for a loan. We are already in debt. We are in deep debt. And we don't know how long this will go on. And it's not, it's not going to change in the short term. Uh, uh, things are, uh, I, I spoke to Roger Miller the other day, and he said, well, it'll be April before you really see a change. Uh, and Roger Miller is the transport secretary for Washington and things are backed up in the port. So right off the bat, you know, it's nothing that's going to happen next month. It's going to be April where he thinks some things could improve. I don't know how um, how to survive. Oliver, thank you for sharing that. We'll have some chance to follow follow up on that. Did I cut you off? I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I have time to get to everyone. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, and and I'm I'm hoping that if we can be successful on this effort and get the word out, so we can get you that help. Um, Lisa, let's go to you in Spokane from Swing and Doors. Um, I think a lot of people think this is the newer restaurants or the unstable restaurants. Lisa, how many years um, have you and your family had Swing and Doors in Spokane? Um, my parents, Bob and Barb Materni, opened the Swing and Doors in 1981. So we're going on 41 years. And, and it's really been an incredible place for the community of Spokane and supporting so many different things. You always see Swing and Doors out there helping. And yet this is the time that you need help. Can you talk about some of the debt and challenges you're facing, even as a well-established place and in, in, in running your business there in Spokane? Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, or reiterating um, how much of an honor this is for me. Um, thank you to Senator Cantwell for listening to us. Um, we were shut down in March of 2020. Um, we were able to get the first round of PPP money, which kept 43 employees working, but we basically paid them to stay home because we weren't open for the 12 weeks that we were supposed to use the money. Um, we got the second round of PPP money and things were looking up because we had spent so much money on glass barriers between our booths and installing UV light um, purification systems to keep our air sanitized and healthy. Um, and things were really looking up in about September of 2020. And then we got shut down again. And it's really hard to be open air dining in Spokane in December. Um, but we did it. And we spent more money on tents and heaters. And we had a capacity of 19 people and still kept people working. Um, now we are, we did not get the first round of the restaurant revitalization fund. Um, we were eligible for $130,000 and because we weren't women owned or minority owned or veteran owned, it, it didn't go to us. Um, we could have greatly used that money. Um, this last summer, we saw the great resignation that people are talking about. We lost six or eight people in the kitchen. They went to other industries. We um, applied for a special endorsement to our business license so that we could hire 16 and 17 year olds to wash dishes because nobody wanted to work. Um, we're still now um, faced with this Omicron variant. We also have staff that are rotating in and out because they're sick and we want them to stay home, but we are short staffed. Um, we have customers staying home again because they're scared of the variant. We um, now are facing higher prices, higher minimum wage, lack of product. Um, we thought that 2022 was going to be the light at the end of this pandemic tunnel, and 
not so much. Well, Lisa, thank you for sharing your story. It's always tough to, to do that, um, but uh, we're working really hard to try to get that to you and do what we can from there. Again, we'll have some questions at the end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go uh, down the road from you, well, quite a ways down the road from you, and go down to Kennewick um, to Doug and Carrie uh, Lundgren um, from Cedars. Um, thank you for, for being here today. A lot of people don't realize our industry is dominantly small business, and I think you can see that here today, but uh, Right around 85% of our operators are, are what anyone would consider a tiny business, a small business, and um, really yet make up the vibrancy of our communities. And, and Pier 1 certainly, Cedars of Pier 1 certainly does that. Thanks for all your work there. Um, what would you most want people to know about where you're at and what, how important in the R, getting the RF to you would help in your business? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same story as everyone else. Um, our business was established in 1976. We are an iconic restaurant in the Tri-Cities. Everybody knows that lives here where Cedars is at. Um, and we're struggling to keep it there. We want to keep it open. We want to make sure we don't close. But uh, we lost a million dollars in gross sales in 2020. And in 2021, probably lost at least half that much again. And when we purchased this business in 2019, we had savings in the bank. You know, we, we had a nice down payment. We had a cushion. We had a good plan. We had a very successful business. And then when we closed in 2020, between then and now, all of our savings is gone. We owe more on the building than we did when we bought it. We're facing the same issues as everyone else. We're understaffed. Product is hard to get. When we do get it, it's expensive. And just trying to stay relevant. You know, we can't shut the doors because if we do, like the other gentleman said, it's tough to get back open. So you just keep plugging along. and. Um, you know, it's a month to month thing now where it used to be a very solid venture. So we applied for the, the, our, the restaurant revitalization also in the first hour that the applications were available, we were qualified for $750,000. Um, we didn't get it because money ran out and we just, we just want to stay open. We want to keep our people working, but it is a challenge every day just to keep the doors open. We can't even operate at full capacity at this point. Carrie, thank you so much for sharing your story. I know it's difficult to do, but it's important for people to hear how much this would mean. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to introduce Ethan Stoll. Um, Ethan, are you back there somewhere? You shifted off my screen. There you are. Hi, Ethan. Um, Ethan, Hi, um, a lot of people you know you as one of the most well-known chefs on, on, on the West Coast and all you've done. But one of my favorite parts about you is you mentor a lot of up-and-coming chef and chef-owned restaurants across the region. You get to talk to people all of the time. Can you guys give some folks like not even about yourself and I know you're struggling with it too, but the bigger picture about all the people you mentor and you talk to what you're hearing from them and their struggles and what kind of red flags are you hearing about. Uh, well, sure. Uh, thanks, Anthony. First off, I want to thank everybody for showing up and also I want to thank the Senator for putting this together. I think it's hugely important uh, and it's something we need to be talking about. So I uh, definitely appreciate everybody uh, who's here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I will talk uh, about Omicron first, and then we'll go into some other stuff. I'm going to talk more about the restaurant industry as a whole. Right? I, Omicron, I can certainly testify, is the hardest time of the pandemic by far. It just is. You know, we've been shutting down restaurants. Uh, you know, we've shut, shut down for several days, one for 10 days. Um, um, you know, there's just a lot going on right now. And it's just, you're just playing whack-a-mole every day at work. And it's just stressful and hard. It just is. You know, um, um, I also want to point out, you know, the, yes, the pandemic has gone on for two years uh, and Omicron is, is, the, is the hardest point. But I also want to be very clear to people, this is not the end or even near the end of the, of the pandemic and its aftermath of, you know, of effects. Uh, you know, supply chain issues people have talked about, staffing uh, shortages and needs, uh, those are going to go on for years. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be negative, but they're going to go on for a couple of years. Um, um, and, and, and everybody here knows that, you know, restaurants can't, can't raise their prices to match their costs of goods because customers would revolt. I can personally say we've been raising prices a little bit here or there, and we've gotten more complaints about price than we ever had in, have in the past. You know, uh, uh, and everybody sees it in the newspaper. I mean, we all read the newspaper, but uh, it is not, uh, it, you know, it's not something that people are, are generally well known about. That supply chain issues are, are, are horrible right now. Um, and, and as Anthony said, yes, I've been around for a long time. There's a bunch of restaurants and a bunch of friends. Uh, I help out a lot of people with their businesses, how to get them started. And, you know, what, you know, what are some key metrics for them to look at? Um, uh, and there's a lot of people stressed out right now. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people stressed out right now. Like, I don't even know what to do. I'm getting calls like that. 
on a weekly basis. Like, hey, how do I how do I handle this? You know, Anthony said, you know, one hundred sixty thousand dollars per restaurant. Yeah, I mean, that's that you know, that's a fair you know that you know that's a good number. You know, and we're talking about business owners that are not you know they got this you know mostly for a passion project or this what they know or what they grew up with in their family they're not savvy business people you know for the most part there are some for sure but the majority uh, are small business owners that you know that are doing this for a passion project or because they you know it's the family business and one hundred sixty thousand dollars i mean you know if if i had one hundred sixty thousand dollars in my credit card debt i'd be stressed out too but you're talking about $160,000 in a business and most of them have their house guaranteed for the lease or for a loan. Uh, you're, you're not talking about just losing $160,000. You're talking about people losing homes. Uh, you're talking about people going bankrupt. You're talking about people ruining their credit scores, not being able to get apartments. Uh, there's a huge wave of aftermath that could come from this. And I think will in some, some effect, right? Um, um, and, and I also want to talk about the RRF program. You know, I mean, two thirds of, of businesses did not get funded. Uh, I want to be very clear that that I'm not I'm not I'm not mad at the ones that got it. Um, um, I just think it's fair to fully fund it. You know, these are these are everybody who applied. These are metrics that uh, uh, the government put out saying, hey, if you hit these metrics, you qualify and you need assistance. And um, uh, and they didn't put enough money in. You know, you know, obviously we appreciate the PPP stuff. Uh, and the people that got the RRF, but it, it, you know, in all honesty, you know, there's some friends of mine, like you know, there's a friend of mine named Trey Lamont. He owns Jerk Shack, right? He's down. He's a single owner operator. I know his house is guaranteed on his loan for the business. You know, he got zero. He owns one business. He's just getting started. He's a super nice guy, really engaged in the community, philant, you know, you know, you know, very, very philanthropic minded. But he's got his house guaranteed for this thing, and he's accruing debt, and he didn't get any money. And some businesses got millions of dollars. There's, there's, a, you know, there's, there's something in that equation that's just not right. So, you know, I definitely um, um, uh, 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 think that uh, uh, um, getting this thing fully funded is important. Uh, and obviously having Senator Cantwell as part of that is a huge leader in that. We appreciate everything. You know, what we really need right now is everybody to really speak up, talk, you know, make some noise about it. You know, we have to keep in mind, this pandemic is nothing that any of us caused. You know, it's nothing that anybody in the restaurant industry caused. And the worst outcome would be that, uh, that a lot of people are losing their homes. You know, a lot of people losing their homes, losing their credit score, all these things that we all take for granted are literally on the line at this point. So I think it's important. I think it's important to get the message out and anything anybody here can do, uh, please help out. Uh, and if anybody wants to chat, happy to chat. So thank Ethan, you. Ethan, thank you so much, Juan, for all your mentoring of those who, who really needed the advice and, and being there to support them. All of you, thanks for being on today. Also, Ethan, thanks for reminding people the restaurant relief fund is really revitalization fund is to help with debt. This is not free money. This is incurred weight and strain on your ability to move forward. Senator Cantwell, anything you'd like to ask these operators uh, at this time? Uh, or clarify? I, I just want to thank you for persevering. Um, you all articulated in your own voice the challenges uh, that face you and your businesses. And I just can't thank you enough for being such you know, hardy individuals to keep going during the pandemic. I mean, it is just unbelievable what you have done to keep these important businesses uh, alive and the workforce that they employ, to say nothing of the history of the culture and the great cuisine that you, you give to our community. So um, I, I think you've illuminated some of the issues that are uh, plaguing businesses that could be helpful. Um, we also wanna encourage uh, as a group that we also talk to the White House. As I mentioned, I'm a member of the Small Business Committee and a lot of the members that are working on this bill are members of the Small Business Committee. So we get and understand the plight of small businesses. By the way, they employ about 75% of people in the United States work for small businesses. So this is really a big economic issue for the country. Um, I hope we'll all reach out to the White House as well and get the White House to be uh, supportive of this effort. It's, it's imperative that we uh, take care of our economy and uh, the mainstay of small businesses in many communities are these restaurants. And so just again, thank everybody for persevering during this difficult time. And we look forward to working with you in the next couple of months as we try to turn up the focus on this issue and work with our colleagues to get the help and support that will help all of you in the long run.
right. And, and, Ansley, do we have time for questions or? We do have time for questions. And I know we have at least a couple. First, let's start with Ashley from KEPR in the Tri-Cities. I know she had a question, Ashley. Hi, yes. Um, my question is for, um, are we allowed to ask like specific business owners? Perfect. So it is for Doug and Carrie at Cedars. And I was just wondering, looking forward with the past two years, what kind of a position are you in and how are things looking forward for 2022? Well, like I said, 2022 is pretty dire, to be honest. You know, we hate to be vulnerable. We don't want to give the impression that we're going to give up because we certainly are not. But uh, we are, you know, out of funds. We we are operating day to day, and just barely making it at this point. Luckily, we have really loyal patrons, and as people get more comfortable coming out, we hope by spring things will be better. But you know, it's touch and go to make sure we get there to spring, and when we can open the patio and people can eat outside again. So um, it's tough. We're gonna hang in there. Don't we're not giving up, but it is tough. It's very tough. Ashley, does, do you have anything else or that, does that answer your question? That answers it. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Then uh, next we have Keith Eldridge. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Um, for Senator Camwell, um, you said contact the White House. Uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, support do you have for this, uh, both within your caucus and, uh, and across the rotunda in the, in the, the house, uh, where, where are you gonna be going with this? And are you gonna have a hard time selling this because people are, are done with the pandemic and they see perhaps it coming to an end yet obviously listening to these restaurant owners, they say, no, it's not coming to an end. I was downtown Seattle last weekend, restaurants weren't even a quarter full. Well, thank you, Keith. And being a veteran of uh, many legislative you know, battles that you've covered, you get it and understand it. So I, I would say that our challenge is uh, people have been focusing on uh, you know, the Build Back Better legislation. And uh, what we need to do is get this particular piece uh, focused on. We had hoped that maybe if that came to the floor, we would include this. Uh, so now there's a bipartisan group, as I said, mostly run by the chair of the Small Business Committee, Ben Cardin, and working with um, uh, Roger Wicker, our colleague from Mississippi. So it's definitely bipartisan. I think there's about uh, six to eight of us right now who are working together to try to get enough bipartisan support. So um, the leadership in both the House and Senate have said that they will bring it up if uh, we get a resolution to this problem. Some of our colleagues obviously want pay fors. Uh, our colleagues, many of the Republicans who have come on board so far say that they would like to see the package uh, paid for. So that makes it a little more challenging in the in the mix. But I'm hopeful that we'll be able to come together on this because you know it is it is a crisis. Uh, these people are barely hanging on. They should have gotten the help and support. So, um, we definitely want it to be now that uh, other things have uh, moved off the table, we think this should be a priority within the next 60 days. Great. Keith, do you have anything else? Yeah, I'm just curious, is there a way to make it uh, more equitable? Um, because it seems like everybody on the call today did not get the help the last go around. What's going to uh, make it so that... Uh, whatever piece of the pie there is that everybody gets a slice. Well, last time it was about, I think about $29 billion. So this is a more robust package, more 60 billion, I think is the proposal that we've been talking about. And uh, so it would co just cover more of the people. I mean, the problem was the number of people, the money just ran out. And so even though there were more restaurants that qualified, they, the, the funds just ran out. And so I think some people thought that that would get us through the crisis. I think they thought that that would uh, end the situation and that we'd be back into better economic times. And we now have a really good glimpse of what's happened since last summer and we're not through it. And these people are barely hanging on and they represent such great 
parts of our economy, as I said, so many parts of small businesses, um, you know, it's the mainstay of our economy are employed in small businesses. So we don't want to lose more. So we think that those additional dollars would help us uh, cover a big percentage of them. And, and Senator, if you're okay, if I, Keith, if I can follow up with that, I think the other thing that's different this time is we know what we got. I think last time when we did the revitalization fund, we didn't know how many people were going to qualify. All the operators who could qualify applied, put their application in, and, and, and we know that there's 4,000 Washington restaurants who applied, qualified, and did not get it. So the number is now known. It's not this mystery number of what we need. And so I think the equity is going to come from filling what we know. And, and, and with the senator's support and our delegation support, encouraging the rest of the country, let's, let's get going. Let's get small business the help it needs. We know what it is now. And I think that's a big difference than the first time around. Was that a fair statement, Senator? Yes. And then I think what you guys did for me today was give me a lot of data and input as to why the problem is so complex. Um, the, the, the fact that you're still facing increased costs, less uh, workforce, uh, less ability to keep your doors open. As Ethan said, this isn't going to be the last of this anyway, even if Omicron numbers uh, come down, we're still going to be uh, challenged in many ways. The sector is going to be challenged. So uh, you've given me a lot of, let's just say, background to explain to our colleagues why this is still a pressing issue. I think some people say, well, I went and I saw a restaurant open and, you know, why is, why is this still an issue? And um, I think, again, I'm just so admiring of all of you. Um, the Lisa, thank you for what you said about what you had to do to just survive in Spokane in the winter time. And this is what people don't understand. I mean, you guys are great entrepreneurs. You've been hustling. You've been doing everything. I mean, I just admire your spirit that you've been able to keep up. And so we have to explain to people that you're not out of the woods, that, that the complexity of the problem uh, that you face because of that, you know, of what's transpired and is going to continue to transpire, we're going to have uh, more loss. And I think we, we don't really want to see more loss. That's the point. We don't really want to see more loss in this sector. Thank you. Great. Now we have um, Rebecca White from the Spokane Public Radio. Hi, Senator Cantwell. I had a question on the uh, the actual, would this, you know, if you do get a bill together, would it just be to address the debt that restaurants are carrying forward? Or could there be other uh, ways of getting funded, like retaining or recruiting workers or other types of funding that could be available to them? Um, maybe Anthony could express, I, we've been looking at a couple of different provisions you know, obviously trying to gain support from our colleagues. Um, some of them have suggested that we broaden it to, you know, live venues and venues who've also been impacted. Um, but maybe Anthony could describe uh, the requirements last time and what you had to do to qualify. I, I think the, where we're focused here today and talking about today is the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. And, and that part of the package really just focuses on debt. And so this is debt that Lisa's really occurred in Spokane. She's struggling to catch up with given all these headwinds and is gonna help her get free of that debt so she can start moving forward and facing these new challenges. Um, and, and that's this particular package we're talking about today, that's really what it's focused on. And to build on what some of the senators said, just two weeks ago, there's, uh, we had a, a member restaurant in Bellevue um, whose landlord said, we're out of time. And, and they had paid their, their rent the last couple of months, but they still had all this debt back from to 2020 that they hadn't been able to keep up on and, uh, and they've lost their business now. And so that, that debt race that we're in is the urgency to this um, because we can only ask the people we owe money from and we got in debt to during 2020 so long before their patience runs out. Um, and, and our small businesses really start getting hurt. So this particular package is focused on this. Yeah, but Anthony, the debt, the debt focus of the revitalization plan was just to focus on your cost, right? Your cost, cost yes. Or, and and yes. How, how those costs would put you out of business. And so to try to recoup the loss of cost for not having, you know, uh, customers. Good clarification, thank you. Yeah. 
Hey, great. And we have a few more questions uh, lined up just for everyone's awareness. We have, I have a list of uh, four more. We have uh, going down into the Vancouver area. We have first have Sarah Wolf with the Columbian. Hi, uh, I, this is kind of for all of the business owners. Is there one particular part of this very complex um, array of issues that is more impactful on your businesses than another? Or is it kind of just the combination of all of them that has put your businesses in such a dire state? You want me to take that? I mean, I, can, I mean, it, it is it is the combination of all the things, but you're talking about um, you know how a restaurant operates. You know, Steve said it earlier. We you know we operate on volume, right? So basically, you know, a restaurant, you know, the first ninety percent of, of your day of sales is um, is covering your cost. Yeah, and the last ten percent of your sales, if you're busy, is your profit. It's just how it is. You know, there's a lot of cost open the doors every day. So when those numbers go down. Uh, you're basically eating away all your profit. It's not like your profit goes down, uh, you know, down 10% of profit. All your profit goes away. So, and now we're dealing with obviously Omicron and staffing issues. So not being able to open a door, all those costs are still there and you can't bring any business in to offset any of those costs. Uh, and then supply chain issues. I mean, I mean, as much as everybody says, it raises the, raise your prices a buck or two. We're not even talking about a buck or two. We're talking about, you know, you know, 40% higher, 50% higher. I mean, you know, right now, if we wanted to run the normal food cost, you know, a roasted chicken, you know, like you have, or a piece of salmon would be $70. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, the, you know, the supply chain is, 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 is tough. I mean, you know, and since we are a volume-based business, we have to offer a good value or else we won't get people in the door, you know, and then, you know, all the debt factors in all that stuff adds up. And it just, I mean, I, I, I won't lie, you know, the restaurant industry, I love my industry, but I won't, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat. It's a hard industry. You know, it is, you know, you're dealing with uh, uh, tons of people, a lot of them young. Um, um, and, and it's just a tough business. I mean, and I love my business. I love having employees uh, and I love what I do, but it is a hard business. So when you have a few things stacked against you, uh, not being able to open shortage of employees, it means everybody else is getting a bunch of overtime. They're getting cranky. You know, I mean, it's hard, you know, so every time you have to shut the doors, you know, you're, you know, like literally shutting the doors one or two days a month means that restaurant's not profitable at all. Um, Ethan, uh, Ethan right. I love Mighty Bowl in Vancouver. And I keep asking, like, why are these guys in Seattle? Like, but this is the point, like, not only will the sector struggle, you're not going to get any expansion, right? If everybody's going to go through this debt laden environment, you're not going to be able to do the things you want to do to help your business grow in the future. You're not even going to be able to consider that. I mean, just like Carrie and Lisa are just struggling to keep the doors open, but, but uh, you know, we want to see some of these, you know, I think Steve, you started as a, as a, as a truck business and then went to the restaurant business. But I mean, you could say that what you've developed could be expanded, but that's not good. I mean, you're not going to do that if you're just trying to survive. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the kind words. That's sweet. I want to add to what Ethan was saying, because it's easy to say, well, why don't you just raise prices? Like that's just, you know, that's, that's uh, economics. But the, the, what he's saying is that the amount we have to increase so much, what that will do is cause our volume to actually go down. So it actually plays against because it's in the industry, it's called price, uh, price elasticity. And, and so you can increase the price so much that it kind of crosses to where the, the, your volume goes down and you didn't actually make any more revenue. So it's, we're between a rock and a hard place when it comes to that. Thank you so much. Um, next we have, uh, sorry, Sarah, is that, is that cover your question or did you have another one? It does, no, we're good, thanks. Okay, great. Next we have Liz Birch with COIN also in the Vancouver, Portland area. Hello, yes, thank you so much for your time. My question is for Senator Cantwell. Uh, kind of piggybacking off of what Keith was talking about with the restaurants we've heard from who didn't receive that aid in the first round. With this next round of money, if you're able to get it passed, what percentage of restaurants do you think realistically would get it? And what would the criteria be for them to receive that aid? Well, we would hope that um, all that qualified would be able to get help and support. Uh, Anthony might know the numbers for, you know, our state. And I know you're representing our, you know, the region, Southwest, you know, region. So we'd have to get you Oregon numbers as well. But I think, um, you know, 
we think if we doubled the amount of money that we had put forth last time, that we'd be coming close to covering uh, a you know a big chunk, if not uh, the majority of the. I mean, most of those businesses. And, and I would I would agree with the senator that we're we're seeking the the backfill of those who've already applied. They've already gone through the vetting and the qualification process. So for Washington alone, that's about four thousand restaurants. We're hoping to help. Um, and then Liz, I can uh, find out the Oregon number um, uh, for you and get that to you. So you kind of have something for the Northwest if you want it. Thanks so much. And would the criteria be different than last time then, or would it be the same? No, the same. They, yeah, hopefully they've already qualified and the way we were, we're hoping to pursue this. And so it's a known. We, we might get, uh, you know, some of our members who, you know, might want, you know, uh, to broaden who's eligible, but I, you know, for the most, it, you know, it's really focused, you know, on the restaurants themselves. Okay, next we have Christine on behalf of McClatchy. So this is a wide region. Hi, thank you for uh, doing this. Uh, this question is sort of for the Senator and any business owner that maybe wanted to jump in. Um, it seems that, you know, relief funds are still in the long term, just a stopgap, especially if we continue kind of in this cycle of pandemic rules and regulations and a just rainbow of the public's understanding of how to go about their lives. Um, it seems that the guidance is dated, especially when it comes to vaccinated employees. I'm sure all of the business owners have dealt with that headache probably more than once at this point. Um, and so my question is, how would refunding this program ensure that we're not just putting another Band-Aid on a situation that's just going to kind of continue in this uh, treacherous cycle again? Well, these are these are hard questions. And I think you have to look at each of these sectors of our economy and ask yourself how important and vital are they to our sector? We were very involved in uh, legislation around the transportation sector, which was you know, really hard, but uh, we also believe that if we wanted our economy to recover, we needed to keep it going in transportation. And um, that's proven to be true, that we wouldn't have, uh, the United States has done better than other countries because we did fund uh, uh, our transportation sector during the crisis. Here, we're talking about, again, 75% of, of jobs in the United States of America are small businesses and restaurants represent a very big chunk of that and a very big chunk of uh, what is essential in every community to uh, doing business. If you don't have restaurants, then people aren't gonna locate other businesses there. You're not going to be able to, um, you know, in the Tri-Cities have the, you know, have the wine community or the diversity that, that we have there. And, you can say that, you know, just in any part of, I've, I remember participating in many uh, uh, economic development things in Spokane when Spokane wanted to get all of these, uh, they wanted to get the World Skating Championship there and they wanted to get all of these events. The first thing that those people ask is, do you, what are your restaurants? Because if people are gonna come there, what are your restaurants? And they wanna know. And um, this is such an important aspect of just growing your economy is to, to have a vibrant restaurant industry. Uh, otherwise you're just not going to be as an attractive location for people to live and work. And so we just, we have to get that through our head that these, that, that again, 75% of small businesses, 75% uh, of jobs in America come from small businesses and that, that we're not going to have the communities and they're not going to have the vitality of those communities if we don't uh, have a strong restaurant economy. Great. Christine, does that um, cover your questions? Oh, oh geez. Uh, sort of. I don't know if a restaurant owner had any thoughts on that. I'd be interested to hear from someone if they were willing to jump in. But thank you, Senator. I mean, I, I can I can mention everything she just said was like spot on. It was perfect. Um, you know, restaurants, you know, we, you know, we make living off of restaurants, but there's so much more to them than that. Their communities, uh, their developments, you know, if restaurants shutter and people don't want to get in the industry anymore because so many have, have lost their, you know, lost their livelihoods from it. You know, it, it hinders all kinds of stuff. I mean, we need restaurants downtown in Seattle bad right now because we need to have uh, uh, draws to get uh, uh, office workers back. 
and 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 the and the financial impact of restaurants goes well beyond their four walls. You know, they they do create communities. They bring up the value of of buildings around them so people can develop. You know, you often see. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, right now, the, you know, it's been going on for years. But the strategy is. We're going to build a building and we got to have a restaurant retail on the ground floor because all that foot traffic restaurants creates, creates value for the buildings and for the neighborhoods and for the houses around them and the communities, all kinds of stuff it has big impacts on. Okay, finally, we have Jordan uh, from KNDU in the Tri-Cities area. Alrighty, thank you. Well, I actually have a question for Anthony. So what Steve said earlier really resonated when he said, you know, we're far from the end of this pandemic and the effects that it has. So Anthony, according to data that you've seen, with the help of this legislation, do you foresee a light at the end of the tunnel for restaurants? And when would we see that? We're looking, you know, at like years down the road. So um, great question. One, I, I wanna be careful because way back when we said we're gonna be out of this pandemic in, the, in two weeks to a month, and there's so much we don't know. And then that was said, I'm not trying to make fun of anyone, we're all doing the best we can. No one expected these things that have just kept going and going. Um, and so that being said, I do want to offer some hope and I want to talk a little bit about the future. One, we saw a good demand this summer that our customers missed us. They wanted to be back um, in communities where there weren't conventions or businesses downtown that still really struggle because that has not returned. But people are just out in their own communities in those areas. People missed us and they were excited to be back. Um, and so that tells me that uh, particularly with the generations that are coming through that really value experiences and supporting local businesses, um, the future is gonna come back. That being said, um, if you're talking normal, there's a handful of headwinds I'd mention. One, without relief, and if you can get to a 4% margin with these headwinds will be challenging, you're talking three years of no profit before you can pay off the debt that's incurred. Um, and so that alone is a number. I think if you're looking at the return of the convention business and some of those areas to the broader region, I think you're talking two years for that. And then the workforce shortage that we're facing um, is really um, its own issue in its own right, but we're gonna be struggling with reinventing our business for that for, for three to five. And so these factors really, we need this relief so we can start figuring these things out and start moving forward. And, and Senator, again, thank you for helping us get the word about how important this is today. Thank you. I thank think you. At, at this point, we do not have any more questions. Um, I wanna thank everyone for taking part, participants and the journalists who joined. Uh, again, if you do want to uh, find a time to meet with one of the restaurant owners, please, if you have not already, please contact Roya, who is the, our press secretary, who you, uh, you should have already been in contact with uh, to, get the, to get the information for this. And she can uh, help connect you with the restaurant owner in your area uh, for an interview or from, for some B-roll. I think with that, we are at an end. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for their time and thank you Senator for putting this together. We'll stay in touch. We'll keep Good. you get progress reports. Thank you everybody. I'll, I'll keep bugging to all the operators. Keep thank fighting. You. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.